you can't manage a secret. If we can get that on the table and we can understand where the problems are, we have enough talent and intelligence to figure it out. But if we don't know the problems are there, if we're not attuned to the early warnings that things could be shifting, we're going to miss it. Uh, the end of competitive advantage is, is meant to be a little provocative, but it does reflect something that I think is pretty important, which is that in strategy for years, we've thought the ultimate holy grail is a thing called a sustainable competitive advantage. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If you can find one, wonderful. Uh, the difficulty is that in more and more parts of our economy, what we're finding is that that way of thinking can actually be something of a trap. And just to illustrate, I'll use an example that will be familiar to all of us. You've all heard of Jim Balsillie, right? Um, so he was interviewed on television in 2008, and the interviewer asked him, have you ever thought about what you would do if this device, this BlackBerry, wasn't your core business? To which Balsillie responded, no, no, I don't, I don't think that way. I, I don't look up too much. I don't look down too much. I think the great fun is just doing what you do every day. It either goes to the moon or it crashes to earth, but it's going to the moon pretty good. He honestly said that. Um, and my purpose in, in raising this is not to say that Jim Balsillie is an idiot, because he's not. He's super smart. Um, the company transformed our lives. It changed the way we do business. It changed our expectations for communication. So it was a pretty impressive accomplishment. The dilemma was that at that moment, he'd experienced nothing but success. That was April of 2008. BlackBerry reached its all-time stock price high in June of that same year and began a retreat which has not ceased uh, since. And this is the trap, I think, of this sort of sustainable competitive advantage thinking, that once we've built it, once we're there, that, that that's kind of an unassailable position. And it's very easy to fall into that trap, so I'm quite sympathetic. What I think we need to be doing as a community, though, is becoming much more aware of competitive advantages that are transient or temporary. And this chart, to me, really illustrates what I'm talking about. This is the market share exchanges of players in the gaming business. We begin with arcade games, right? Back in the day, that's all there was. You had to go to a physical place and throw money into this machine, and it played one game, right? Those gradually gave way, in market share terms, to games that were played on dedicated purpose devices. So games played on a Nintendo or games played on a Sony device. Then those gave way to games that were played on general purpose devices. So you took a shrink-wrapped box, and you put your CD in a computer, and you played your games that way. And of course, today we're looking at games that are played on mobile devices, inside other people's platforms, on social media. Um, and what I want you to think about here is the pattern. You have a period of insight where you see something someone else sees first, better, more completely. Uh, then you have a period of time to capitalize on that insight, a moment when you get to enjoy the fruits of your labor, and then you know, competition comes in, technology shifts, customers get bored, you know, what have you done for me lately? I don't want to work with shrink-wrapped software. Um, and, and your advantage can sometimes come under pressure. And what I am arguing is that in more and more parts of the economy, this is happening quickly. And therefore, we as leaders, as executives, as, as brand constituents, need to be thinking about what are the early warnings that I need to be paying attention to, and what actions should I be taking before I get caught by surprise, before I find myself you know, scrambling to catch up with a competitor that's doing um, really, really well. So one of the first things I'm going to argue is that we often make, in my opinion, a mistake in strategy by focusing way too much on our industry. And when I started in the field, you know, uh, people that were working on things like innovation and new business development were sort of over in a corner, huddled for warmth, while the really cool kids were doing industry analysis, you know, an order of entry analysis and so forth. Today, the most significant competition your organization faces is highly likely to come from some organization that you wouldn't even consider to be in your industry. 
but they're competing for something that you need. Disposable dollars, disposable time, the need to get a particular job done, which could be done any number of different ways. Uh, this chart that I've got here is a study that was done by the Wall Street Journal in 2014, and they were interested in exploring how spending patterns in the American public had changed since the introduction of the iPhone and Android in 2007, that really kind of fateful year. And they looked at discretionary spending, and what was down? Discretionary spending on clothing, eating outside the home, uh, automotive, travel, all down. The two largest growth segments, American household spending, telecommunications and home internet. Double, double digit growth. So if you're a maker of apparel, or you happen to run a local restaurant, and you're busy benchmarking yourself against other apparel makers or other restauranters, you're kind of missing the plot line, because the real challenge is people are putting money into being connected and into those kinds of technologies rather than into things they might have spent their money on before. And if you miss that, it can cause you to really overlook something pretty fundamental in what you're doing. So my argument today is that we have some new ways of thinking about strategy, about how we run organizations, um, that are a little challenging to many of the traditional precepts. And I'll just run through a couple of them. It's what I call the new strategy playbook. So in traditional strategy, stability was seen as the normal thing, and change was seen as the unusual thing. In fact, I recently did a, a search engine search for the phrase change management. Guess how many results? Over 40 million. 40 million results on just that phrase change management. Um, and I think it's interesting that when we look at companies that are quite successful at sort of navigating these successive waves of competitive advantage, what you tend to see is they're in motion. They're continuously, I call it, reconfiguring. A great example of a firm like that's pretty local to here, a company called FactSet. They sell financial data to other uh, financial services firms, and they will tell you they're constantly pushing for new business models. They move people's roles around. They change a lot. Um, and because they're already in motion, adapting to the next change gets easier. What's problematic is when you are at rest almost and you have to start from a standing position. So think about continuously adapting your organization to the changes in the environment that you're facing. So that's one of the first things. Second thing is something I call healthy disengagement. Now, it stands to reason if you've got these waves of advantage and some of them are going to be going into erosion, you need to be able to pull resources out of that so that you can repurpose those resources for something else. But this is really hard um, because in a lot of companies, people get very identified with the business that they run or the customers that they serve. And so disengaging is almost like you're challenging their sense of safety, you're challenging their sense of self. So companies do it because they have to, but it often happens way too late. It happens with a lot of agony, and it can do a lot of damage to the relationships uh, in the firm. Instead, what you want is a rather clear understanding of when are we going to exit a particular um, model. A great example of this is what Verizon did when they decided to really change their business from being a plain old telephone operator to being a player in the world of broadband distribution and wireless services and all the other things that they're in. And uh, Ivan Seidenberg took a look at some of his businesses and he said, ha, yellow pages, like printed paper yellow pages? probably not a growth business. And he performed the her heretical act of selling it while it was still generating pretty healthy cash flows. And of course, he was criticized at the time, and people were very dubious about his sale of this very safe-seeming, long-term kind of product to get into these wild areas like Fios and advanced networks. And of course, here we are, you know, many years later, and people are very pleased that his bets have paid off. Um, and he really moved the company into a completely different set of spaces. Had he hung on to physical phone books and landlines, that company would be much less relevant than it is today. So healthy disengagement, getting out you know, while there's still time, while there's still value. The third thing that's different is, and this is kind of existential, we have to figure out a way of separating out the power in your organization from the resources control in your organization. This is hard. 
So let's take a little, a little thought experiment. Imagine to yourselves that you are Mr. Sony Walkman at the height of that business's success. You've had nothing but literally decades of success. You have an office, and right next to that office is the Walkman historical display. It's got every model of Walkman ever created all over the world, and it's a real you know, iconic sort of space. And uh, you come to a conference like Bright, and you think to yourself, wow, the future. Maybe I should be thinking about what the future holds for my business. Well, if you think about it, right, what got you where you are? Well, AA batteries, you know? little worrying gizmos that take content in album form off of some kind of fixed media, you know, beginning with cassette tapes, and then later on we have CDs and so forth, but they're albums, right? And then replaying that content in very uh, high fidelity fashion, you know, in a portable manner. That's what got you where you are, right? So you invite people to come and explain to you what the future is. So R&D, come talk to me about the future. And they come in and they say, okay, well, in the future, no more double A batteries. No more little whirring gizmos. In fact, no more media, no more albums. It's all going to be songs. They're going to fly through the air and land on a hard drive, and the music they play is going to be less high quality than what we can produce today with our technology that's current. Does this sound wonderful to you? Like, yes, fantastic. Let me dig into my pocket and bring about my own doom, right? <laughs> well, I'm telling this in a humorous way, but it actually happened pretty close to that way. Uh, Sony had everything they needed to produce something like an MP3 player or, a, or a, an Apple-type product. Uh, what they didn't have was the will on the part of the organization to move resources into promoting that and deprive the existing uh, divisions of the resources that they currently controlled. So you need some counterweight. So let's take an example. Um, at Lego, which has, in the past decade or two, undergone a fantastic resurgence. Uh, their CEO has a firm policy. He says, every business leader in my organization is going to give up 10% of their budget at the end of every year. So the business leaders all know they're going to have to get 10% more efficient. Then we, as a team, are going to collectively reallocate that freed-up resource to those opportunities we think are the most promising. Now, what I think is interesting about the way they've set that up is it doesn't come across like I'm taking money from you and I'm giving it over there. It's no, we as a leadership team are going to figure out how to free up some cash and then how to redirect that resource to where we as a team think it has the most promise. So it depoliticizes a lot of these kind of conversations that, that you might want to have. So this notion of, I call it deft resource allocation, getting resources moved to where they can do the most good, not leaving them trapped and held hostage in the existing businesses. The fourth thing is not going to be news to any of you here, um, but I, it's building innovation as an actual proficiency. In a lot of companies, you know, I have to tell you, it's still kind of episodic. So some senior person will say, you know, we need more innovation around here. You, 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 go form a skunk works, you know. Put on painter pants and come to work at midnight if that's what helps, you know. But what happens? They, they dutifully get to work and they try to make an effort and maybe they have some of their early efforts that show traction, but eventually the senior person leaves or moves on. The company has some problem somewhere else in the business and goes looking for something to cut. Um, and the innovation effort either dwindles away or gets, uh, gets cut out, only to be rediscovered 12 months later when somebody else says, you know, we need... That doesn't work, right? What does work is an actual innovation proficiency. Now, what do I mean by that? There's a government system. There's a funding mechanism. There are appropriate metrics that don't get in the way. Like for a lot of companies, the metrics that they use actually are antithetical to innovation. They cause people to not to want to do it, right? So you, and, and the good news, I think, is that we've learned so much about how to get this right. A lot of companies have not yet taken that lesson, but there's a lot of data that we've got about how you can build an innovation proficiency that really works and is actually a robust ongoing process. And there are companies who I can hold up as examples. So Cognizant would be one um, well-known one that, that, that really does uncover these facts set is another. Uh, to go to Asia, a company like HDFC Bank is, is well-known for introducing innovative products and making it a real proficiency. So I think that's something to bear in mind. Now, leadership. Um, this is all going to call for a different kind of leadership, right? A leadership where people are unafraid to speak the truth and respond to that truth. So one of my favorite examples is uh, Alan Mulally. 
uh, he was at Boeing and was brought into Ford. Now, Ford, at the time, was in deep, deep trouble. This was 2006. And uh, Mullally agreed. He said, well, it's an iconic American company. I have these talents, and I got turned down for the CEO role at Boeing anyway, so why not go to Ford? Gets to Ford, is greeted at the airport, and driven into the executive parking garage at the Ford Motor Company, looks around, and beholds zero Ford-branded cars in the executive parking garage at the Ford Motor Company. And this is not a good sign, right? Now, Mullally's very famous for his management system. What he does is he takes everybody's plans and goals, and they put them on a PowerPoint slide, and they color code them. So green is good, I'm on plan. Yellow is I've got some issues, but I kind of think I know how to f solve them. Red is I'm in trouble and I have no idea uh, what to do. Um, and so, shortly before his very first management meeting, and he was, he's famous for his management system, he has this one big weekly meeting with his entire executive team every week, no matter where he is in the world. And of course, when he first came in, they were all whining like crazy. They're like, no, we're too busy, we've got too many other meetings. So he has his assistant call up all the assistants of all the other executives and cancel all those meetings. He said, see, you've got plenty of time to come to my meeting. <laughs> he's, he's very firm about this. So, before his first big management meeting, he uh, has a meeting meeting with the CFO and is told that Ford is on track to lose 17 billion, that's with a B, or close to 17 billion dollars that year, and is in fact probably months away from having to declare bankruptcy. So things are really bad, right? Comes into the first meeting, all the guys are there, the men and women are there, and they don't like this, right? Because they have to actually show their numbers and they're used to having underlings report on what they're doing and so forth. But they come in the first management meeting and all the reports are green. Think this through logically, right? We're on track to lose $17 billion and all my numbers are green because the culture of Ford at the time was you, you, know, you hid your problems. You hoped you solved them before anybody found out about them. And in meetings, your job was to make the other guy look bad. And Mullally um, said, guys, is it our plan to lose $17 billion? Can that possibly be true? Um, and he said something I think is very profound and it gets to the nature of leadership uh, in this kind of current environment, he said, you can't manage a secret. If we can get that on the table and we can understand where the problems are, we have enough talent and intelligence to figure it out. But if we don't know the problems are there, if we're not attuned to the early warnings that things could be shifting, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss something really important. You can't manage a secret. So anyway, this goes on for a couple of meetings. And then finally, Mark Fields, who's the current CEO of, of Ford after Alan Mullally retired, uh, said, OK, OK, pushes his papers away from himself. I'm red on edge. Now, Edge was this small SUV that Ford was absolutely counting on as one of its product launches that year. And the whole room goes completely quiet. Like, Mullally's got two seconds to, to either, you know, con to convince them that, that he really means it about this red stuff. He really wants to know the truth. What does he do? He stands up and applauds. Great transparency, stops the meeting, says, can anybody provide help to, to Mike uh, in this problem. And it turns out there were people in the room who'd had something very similar happen and had spare resources and had the ability to make recommendations. And within five minutes, they moved on, but you know, they'd started to work as a team. And I think that's much more the kind of ethos we need to be building in organizations than these much more traditional hierarchies that we're often used to living with. Finally, what does all this mean for me, for you, for our careers? Increasingly, I think what we're moving towards is what some people call a tour of duty career strategy. What does that mean? It means I sign up for a, a task, an obligation, a project, a something, and when it's done, I may re-sign up, I may move on. When I leave my company, I stay in contact because I might come back. The boundaries are much more porous. The networks are much more important. And I think our notion of a traditional career is increasingly less relevant to how we're going to be needing to operate. Uh, the phrase I use is, we're all, we're all entrepreneurs now. Um, so if you think about a company, and I just wanted to end on a more positive note, um, a great example of a company that was in newspaper publishing and has dramatically digitized their business is a Norwegian publisher called Shipstead. 
They got on board with this back in 1999, and one of the first things they did was they broke apart their traditional publishing business from their digital business. They started going into online advertising, and as you'll see, the quote here is, you know, the internet was made for classifieds, classifieds were made for the internet. They figured that out ages before anybody else did. And today, what we're really seeing is a, a, they're the number three provider, I believe, of online marketplaces of various kinds uh, in the world. So it's a very kind of inspiring example of a company that wasn't afraid to leave its traditional business behind. So I'll leave you with a couple of closing thoughts that increasingly what we're looking at is a very different na notion of what competitive advantage is. Much more to do with networks, much more to do with social advantages, much more to do with fluid positions and occasionally being a first mover than, uh, than the traditional notions of strategy where it's all about scale and scope.